So I'm gonna go ahead and begin. For those of you that are still entering, we will, um, the room will still be open so you can continue to come in. Um, I'm Jean St. Louis, Jean St. Louis Consulting. Thank you so much for coming. Um, just some usual housekeeping that maybe you have been on the webinars before, maybe you have not. Um, one is we are offering CE for this webinar. So after your attendance, you will get a thank you note and the um, CE information will be in that thank you note. So be on the lookout for that. In addition, we will be having a polling at the end of the webinar. And it's just a fun exercise, kind of asking some questions, get a feel for who's out there anonymously. We don't know who you are. We are not you know, tracking you. We're not gonna stalk you, nothing like that. So please help us. It's just a fun exercise, especially in this time of lockdown. The third thing is um, on the lower level or on the upper level of your screen, you have an area that you can chat or you can um, ask any questions. Please feel free to do that. Um, we, we would love to you know, answer those questions at, at the end. So um, Dale and Monica, I will, um, in, in lack of distraction for you, I'm gonna go ahead and I will put on my picture, but I'm right here and I'm listening and whatnot. Every so often I'll undo my picture, um, but I don't wanna be distraction to you. So that's why I do that. I also will mute and all the attendees are muted. So attendees, your opinion is important. We wanna hear from you. Please unmute at any time. You're welcome to, again, ask questions, no problem on that. So um, in addition, for those of you that are new to these webinars, um, I do offer anyone that's attending the opportunity to have a COVID-19 baseline analysis of your practice. If you are interested, you know how to contact me, um, you know, feel free. Okay, so without further delay, I wanna introduce our, our, two, our topic today, and that is, how is COVID-19 shaping your dental office design? So what changes can you implement today to your existing practice as a result of COVID-19? The planning for the future, how COVID-19 impacts the dental practice design going forward, and then beyond the office, how to give your patients and staff reassurance, which I know I've been on the phone with many, many practices this week, and there is a lot of mixed feelings out there about assurance. I know, for instance, Dale and Monica are from the state of Illinois and their governor, you know, came on Friday night and said, hey, we're open. You can have your dental patients. So dentists were freaking out. Some are ready, some are not. So let me introduce our two speakers who are dynamic speakers. We've got Dale, who is the director of pre-construction and uh, Dale Diner and Monica Smith, who's the director of design. Dale comes to us as the director of pre-construction at Apex. He leads the pre-construction team, which provides budgeting, scheduling, and constructability services that seamlessly connect the design and the construction disciplines for all of Apex projects. He has 15 years of diverse construction experience and re the results-oriented attention to the detail assure that each Apex client of accuracy and accountability in achieving their vision within agreed cost and timeline. And then we have Monica, the director of design. Monica joined the design industry in 2010 and quickly grew into the design director at Apex Design in 2014. With the team of designers she leads, Monica is able to translate the doctor's vision into functional design. Monica's understanding and adaptability shows each project to be unique stemming from the client's inspiration. She also collaborates closely with the architectural and pre-construction teams, ensuring that the budgeting and feasibility of the project is maintained. So let me, without further ado, introduce you formally to Dale and Monica. So go ahead, take it away, guys. Excellent. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Uh, you're able to hear us all right? We can hear you perfect. Excellent. Thank you for the kind introduction, Jean. Good afternoon to you all. It's an honor to be invited to this webinar. I hope everyone is staying safe and well. What Jean's introduction doesn't do is tell everyone about the interesting relationship Monica and I share as we work together, with her being responsible for design and aesthetics and flow, and myself being responsible for clients' budgets and plans, ensuring buildability. It can create a bit of an interesting dynamic at times, can't it, Monica? Yep, that's for sure. A bit of a push and pull, that's for sure. And, um, you know, that's coming from because Dale and I are both looking out for the best interests of our clients. 
but we're both coming from two very different directions. Like I'm on more of the aesthetic and the design side, so I'm always looking out to maximize design and to deliver a really awesome project at the end of the day. And Dale here, we call him the Eeyore, or the kind of fact checker here sometimes. Um, you know, he, he was really looking out for the best interest of the client when it comes to budgeting. So we'll have quite the, you know, back and forth, you know, to the amusement of our clients um, here. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's bringing, you know, some good stuff to, to the table. But at the end of the day, um, we want the best outcome with the project at hand. So, Jean, you already introduced our topics um, very nicely. So I'll move on and maybe we should have a little more of a kind of general um, introduction to this topic here with the fight that we're facing here. Dale, why don't you talk, talk, tell us a little bit more about um, who is our opponent here? Yeah, I think everybody on the call is very well aware of what we're up against here. Um, the coronavirus, which has not previously been identified, which is called SARS-CoV-2 and causes COVID-19, there's a lot of known and there's a lot of unknown things about what we're up against as to our opponent. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, just quoting some things from the CDC and the World Health Organization, we know that the virus is spread mainly through person-to-person -person contact. Uh, we're in close contact with each other. It's transferred through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes or talks. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of persons who are nearby and possibly inhaled into the lungs. We also know that COVID-19 may be spread by people who are not showing symptoms. And finally, we do know that there are ways to protect ourselves and our practices, which we'll cover more in detail shortly. Just a few unknowns here. Um, we don't know when we're gonna see a vaccine. That's a big unknown. Um, you know, while testing is becoming more readily available, uh, we're wondering if there's gonna be a possibility for testing for dental practices. It would be ideal to see a, a testing station within a dental practice in the near future, but as of right now, that's an unknown. And while the curve is flattening in many states, um, we don't know if we're looking at a reoccurrence. So with these things in mind, um, we recognize that we need to treat every patient as infectious and screening of patients will go on for a very long time until an effective vaccine is developed and most of the population becomes vaccinated. We will learn to live with the risk of COVID-19 in our daily life, just as we've learned to live with the awareness of risk after 9-11. Today's younger generation doesn't remember air travel without the TSA lines and all the different things that go through trying to get through security. Uh, just like today's babies may not know a world without major impacts of the novel coronavirus. Yeah, so with that, um, let's discuss what we can do and what changes can the doctors implement today to their existing dental offices as a result of COVID-19? So let's um, break this down a little bit. Um, what we'll do is initially, um, we'll look at what sort of changes we can make from a visual perspective. Um, so let's look at signage, wayfinding, how we might be able to use our existing TVs and monitors throughout the practice. So post visual signs and posters at the entrance and in strategic places, such as the waiting room to provide instruction about hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. If possible, implement one way traffic throughout the practice. Outside of instruction, instructing patients, what sort of reassurances can we provide the patients using our existing equipment? I mentioned the monitors and the TVs. You know, through the process of maintaining guidelines that have been recommended, we tend to forget that the patients are frightened and need reassurance about what your practice does to prevent the spread of virus. It could be something very simple like a slide presentation or a video that plays on TVs or your monitors throughout your practice that the patients can see. Perhaps it's something about the steps that you take to disinfect the op or an internal cleaning checklist that you use for the practice. You could also have the monitors in the practice. Um, you could also have on the monitors in the practice something about the equipment or the partitions that you've installed or your new staff protocol you now use as a result of the coronavirus. Another important aspect uh, to think about is the provision of hygiene supplies for 
staff and patients. It's more important now than ever to provide supplies for respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, including alcohol-based hand rub with 60 to 95 percent alcohol tissues and, of course, hand sanitizing stations located strategically throughout the office for the patient's use. Maybe we'll um, touch on physical barriers next. Monica, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, for sure. We have actually had quite a few clients um, call us up and ask, you know, what can I do when it comes to physical barriers? And, you know, there are different materials you could use for panels. Um, They could be glass or acrylic. And you want to have a surface that's wipeable, but even a medical curtain would work. And um, there's different areas in the office that you might want to consider to incorporate these physical barriers. You know, the first that comes to mind is, of course, um, a check-in at the reception desk. So having a sneeze guard right there on the transaction top um, to provide more of a, you know, safety for not your, only your staff, but also for your patient. Um, and then having dividers between chairs, perhaps, in the waiting room. Maybe your waiting room is not large enough to spread chairs six feet apart. So maybe you want to have dividers and a physical barrier between waiting room chairs. Then in open bays, you could have, you know, in an orthodontist office or a pediatric office, you might have an open bay setup and want to incorporate some of these physical dividers. Those could be freestanding. We've also hung some from the ceiling for some of our clients. Um, so that's definitely something that gives, you know, that reassurance to patients and staff. And then um, depending on the climate you live in and as the weather warms up, you might want to consider to bring some of that initial um, testing or some sort of a triage station to the outdoors or even have um, outdoor seating um, in the beginning. And of course, you can keep your patients waiting in the car as well. But as your patients are coming into the office, Um, having a triage station outside with a divider for privacy um, is another way to incorporate those physical barriers. That's good. I guess um, what we should do is really walk in the steps of the patient. So travel the path of the patient. Um, Take careful consideration into what the patient will be touching as he or she goes through the office. If you have a vestibule door, um, consider keeping it propped open. The same would apply If you have a door between the waiting room to the corridor, think about the patients touching those door handles and the number of patients that you have going through those door openings on a daily basis. So keeping those doors propped open temporarily can help uh, prevent the spread of uh, virus. Encourage your patients to wait in cars uh, while where practical and ask the patients to leave excess clothing and personal items in the car. Look closely at your existing furniture. Is it easily cleanable? Consider replacing couches or fabric covered seatings with antimicrobial fabrics and textiles and easily wipeable seating. It's also suggested that you remove toys, magazines, and other related items from within the waiting room. So that really covers all the visual areas that, or most of the visual areas that you could look at. Now let's look at some non-visual areas um, that you could address. So first off, your ventilation system. We know this is a big topic right now. Um, We know that within a dental office, there's a lot of aerosol generation and contamination is very high, um, which is generated by ultrasonic air polishing, air water syringes and tooth preparation with air. The heating and cooling systems within the office can pick this up, this contaminated aerosol up and transmit it throughout the office. So on a temporary basis, you could consider Uh, installing some portable solutions that create negative air pressure to try to exhaust the area um, and discharge that area direct that air directly to the outside away from people and air intakes or you could direct the air through HEPA filters before it's introduced to other spaces. In my opinion however I do believe that a longer term solution should be considered when looking at your ventilation system within your dental practice, and we'll touch on that later. Another non-visual is uh, look at your work shifts. I was speaking to a doctor recently who has a two-doctor practice with six operatories. 
he was planning on running two shifts, one doctor for three days, Monday through Wednesday with a dedicated team, and the other doctor Thursday through Saturday with another dedicated team. His reasoning was that it could minimize the risk of both himself and his staff and to his practice should someone become infected within the two groups. Also consider your daily huddles. Use your morning huddles to provide a refresher on the protocol for PPE and disinfection, disinfection procedures. Have protocol in place in the morning for staff when te checking temperature and the necessary sanitation steps as they come in in the morning. Look at your existing computers and phones. Uh, discourage any sort of sharing of uh, equipment and supplies, especially headsets that have been near the face and computer keyboards and mice. Move away from any sort of printing or paper handouts. Embrace digital technology. Instead of a clipboard, let's move to a tablet-based system that can be sanitized each time someone touches it for check-in or check-out. The other thing you want to look at is lunch or any sort of eating that happens in the office. We suggest that you look at the staff breaks and lunches and perhaps stagger them or request that they eat in separate areas. Temporary partition could also be looked at in the areas where you would typically eat. Ask employees to bring food, beverages, and that all important coffee from home rather than using the lunchroom resources. This could even include silverware and napkins if you don't have sanitary single, cell, single serve receptacles for these products. And of course, regulate that food that often gets dropped off or gifts that get dropped off as this can also um, be a source where that might be contaminated. And the other thing that we want to touch on is, on is teledentistry. Of course, this is um, you know something that's new and um, I think it's here to stay. This is a digital age for dentistry. Teledentistry is a segment of digital dentistry that is um, rapidly becoming standard operating procedure. What's more, when we reopen our practice, we can use te teledentistry to save time and help assess which patients are the first to see because we have a large backlog of patients requiring treatment. This is actually good news regarding the new normal. So Monica, with your experience in designing dental offices, how do you see dental office design being impacted going forward? For example, when you have a, a new doctor that might come um, to the table and they're looking at real estate, um, what do they do when it comes to uh, now, when it comes to looking at the size of what sort of office they should look for? Yeah, thanks Dale. Um, that's right, because clients do come to us in early phases of real estate um, endeavor and choosing. So they would, they might sometimes even come when they're looking at two or three different properties and trying to determine which one is the right one, which one is best, and which one is the correct size. So when it comes to size, um, clients have been coming to us for recommendations in the past, um, what size of office space they need for the new endeavor. We've been advising them to plan for approximately 350 to 400 square feet per operatory, which does include functions like staff areas and number of doctor offices and consultations rooms. And um, now there's, of course, an efficiency of scale. The more operatories you're planning for, the lower that number of square feet becomes. Um, so we'll touch on the next points um, some more in a bit, but. We see future dental offices needing more space and they need more space for things like staff and patient flow separation, for additional functions needed and for more dedicated workspace. So in the future, with that said, we're foreseeing spaces to go up to about 400 to 450 square feet per operatory. So um, now that we've addressed size, let's talk about the shape of dental offices going forward. Yeah. So in the past, what we've seen a lot are retail spaces that are narrow and elongated rectangular spaces. Um, so you see an example here on the slide on the top. These work very well because they provided maximum efficiency with one central corridor and operatories were often lined up on one side of the corridor with supporting functions and staff areas on the other. Um, today and maybe in the future, we might favor much wider spaces um, 
that are allowing more for a horseshoe flow or a circular flow with separate check-in and check-out areas. Um, so on the example below, which I can't find my mouse, um, you can see there is um, separate check-in and a separate check-out with a patient corridor here, but then a separation of staff areas down below and a staff corridor over here. So you don't want to have paths crossing as much maybe in the future, and you want to separate those clinical and patient areas from your staff and support areas. So moving in from, from the inside out, um, what do we see when it comes to parking, Dale? Yeah, that's good. Um, so when we look at uh, doctors purchasing real estate or buildings, um, oftentimes parking tends to be overlooked. Um, it sometimes tends to be an afterthought, and it's only going to become more important, uh, we feel, in the short term and potentially in the long term, to ensure that there's increased patient parking uh, for you know, dental practices and specialty practices. So um, parking, there, while there's not an exact ratio that we can offer today, we do see that going up in the future. What about the building structure and the envelope of the building itself? You know, and again, um, this is another very important area. As we see um, that there's going to be financial impact on the cost of constructing new dental practices in the future. And so it's going to be more important now than ever to analyze the building envelope or shell of the building to ensure that the building is airtight and structurally sound. Now, as the director of pre-construction, Dale, I think your specialty are the utilities. So what can you tell us about things like... Um, you know, water, electric, HVAC. Yeah, that's um, true. I guess I am known for digging around in old buildings and looking closely at the three main utilities uh, within buildings. And that is, like Monica's already said, water, electric, and heating and cooling, or as we call it, HVAC. Um, we won't look, talk so much about water service sizes or electrical service sizes today, as we don't feel those will be too significantly impacted going forward as a result of COVID-19, what we'll talk extensively about is HVAC. So there are a variety of HVAC systems that we see within dental practices, and the three, and three different typical scenarios that we uh, most often encounter are, one, your typical retail setting, which use, utilizes a rooftop unit, also known as an RTU, a freestanding smaller building with your more traditional split system, with the furnace inside and the condenser outside, more like what you would see with your house. And three, a multi-story building, which has a uh, central system on the roof and individual VAV boxes within the ceilings of the different floors, distributing heating and cooling throughout the different floors. With all these different systems, it is all the more important to look at the factors such as the size of the space and these existing systems to ensure that we achieve the necessary flow rate. We want to see a minimum of 12 air changes per hour. Taking measures to improve ventilation in these areas or the rooms where someone was ill or suspected to be ill with COVID-19 will help and help shorten the time it takes respiratory droplets to be removed from the air. We mentioned earlier that we recommend creating negative air pressure and exhausting the air or running it through HEPA filters. So let's just touch on HEPA filters for a minute. HEPA filters are very effective and are certified to capture 99.97% of particul particulates that are precisely 0.3 micron in diameter. The coronavirus itself is 0.125 micron, but the droplets that it travels in when people cough, talk, or breathe initially are larger, around one micron. So the recommendation of using HEPA filters in a dental practice do assume that the coronavirus is within a droplet and not by itself. Probably our most recommended solution within HVAC systems is the use of ionization. Similar to what happens when lightning, with lightning during a thunderstorm, the ionization processes a strong electrical field that causes the air around the cloud to break down, allowing current to flow in and attempt to neutralize the charge separation. Simply stated, the air breakdown creates a path that short circuits the cloud or earth as if there were a long 
right, metal rod connecting the cloud to the earth. We recommend a system that creates needlepoint bipolar ionization, or NBPI, which is the artificial generation of both positive and negative ions that occur naturally without the production of ozone or byproducts. What NPPI does is it reduces or eliminates particulate pathogens, mold spores, and viruses and converts VOCs or odors. It also helps with energy costs because it reduces pressure on HVAC systems because of its removal of particulate. This technology artificially generates ionization in high densities to maintain between 1,200 and 2,000 ions per cc in our occupied practices, which would typically only see around 100 ions per cc. A good comparison of what you see in uh, different environments is at the top of a mountain, you would see around 5,000 ions per cc. However, in a city, you might only see around 200 ions per cc. This ionization, which flows into the air within a dental practice, will attach to the RNA and DNA cell structure of both airborne and surface pathogens, and the pathogens are no longer able to exist. This product is proven to kill pathogens, including E. coli, MRSA, TB, and neurovirus. The system has over 300 installations worldwide and is installed in many healthcare applications, including hospitals, outpatient centers, and offices. Also want to touch on um, there's been a recent uh, influx of small units that have hit the marketplace that claim HEPA filtration or ionization. And it is now required that all electronic air cleaners pass a UL certification to prove that they produce less than 5 PP PPP and therefore are deemed ozone free. There is no level of ozone that's deemed safe. Several brands of ozone generators have EPA establishment numbers on their packaging and this number helps the EPA identify the specific facility that produces the product. The display of this number does not imply EPA endorsement or suggest that in any way the EPA has found the product to be safe or effective. Another important point about these units and the standalone HEPA units is that most operate on six air exchanges per hour. We touched on earlier that we want to see a minimum of 12 air exchanges. They also don't produce enough ions for your space. Another system that we see um, is UV lighting within HVAC systems and um, within rooms. And we haven't been able to really recommend UV light systems due to the potential risk to staff. Now, I know that the IDPH are um, here in Illinois uh, did recommend a form of it recently. Um, however, from our understanding, we've seen from uh, hospital use uh, that it's been known to discolor surfaces over time. They also just uh, deteriorate filters and plastic wire coatings and insulation, and will break down the coil coatings within HAC units. UV lights cannot reduce particulate or odors. Um, another issue is that the placement of these fixtures or fans, these UV fixture or fans, would need to be optimized for the specific spaces, and the, the effectiveness has yet to be demonstrated within larger public spaces. Very good. Thanks for a lot of information there, Dale. So let's talk a little bit about how we can plan out the space. So we talked already about what can doctors do um, with the existing space, but now let's move into planning out space as if you were building a new practice. So no doubt there's going to be additional functions needed within dental offices. I, I think so. I think so. I think with the increased use of personal protective equipment, or PPE, we will also see an increased need for higher capacity storage. You know, storage has become smaller and smaller over the years, but I think that doctors will find that they will need more storage now. Um, and it's also important to note where that storage is needed because the staff entry will need to have storage adjacent um, to them. So when staff enters um, and they change and put a gown on, they will need storage and perhaps locker rooms. So those are another additional function is locker rooms. Um, so storage and locker rooms and then um, perhaps a laundry area. So if you're using reusable gowns or scrubs, you might need some laundry areas or else you might want to look into um, 
a service that is provided for your staff for that. So Monica, tell me about how room sizes and uh, room quantities are going to be impacted as a result of this. Yeah, room sizes and room quantities. So a certain amount of social distancing might prevail post COVID-19, which will lead to planning of either enlarging the waiting room to allow for adequate distance between chairs or sizing your waiting room way down if you're planning to bring your patients right into the treatment rooms which will consequently increase treatment room quantities. So if you're not wanting your patients to wait in the waiting room and you're making that room smaller, maybe you need to plan when you're planning for a new office to increase how many treatment rooms you want to provide. Um, we will also see treatment rooms to increase in size as you might add functions in those treatment rooms like individual sinks and um, perhaps family seating. So, you know, sinks have been going away over the years. We've been seeing either shared sinks like you see on this image here on a T wall, it's very convenient. But if we see treatment rooms becoming more private and maybe even closed, these sinks will have to move into the treatment room, making those treatment rooms a little bit wider. Another area that will increase in size is the width of the corridor, I'm pretty sure. Um, will become important. Um, having the ability for two people to pass comfortably in the corridor will become a very important factor in planning the flow of your facility. And then not to forget allowing for space so that staff can change PPE before entering a different patient room. Somebody is standing there changing another patient or another staff member needs to pass. Um, then moving into you know, what is the patient experience uh, moving forward? You know, this patients are, are scared and, um, you know, we need to calm them up, down in some ways. And, uh, but also what are we offering to our patients? You know, very popular offering um, over the last decade or so have been beverage bars. Now beverage bars are touched by every patient. So is that something that we want to continue to do? Maybe in the future again, but, um, maybe temporarily you want to consider a more of a concierge approach. And what that is, is, you know, reception desk that allows the staff to come out and um, help somebody or give somebody the beverage instead of everybody reaching in the refrigerator. Maybe they're just getting a bottle of water, water handed um, to them. And then, um, you know, we touched before on family seating. So what we mean by this, you know, of course, ideally, now that you're opening your office, you, you want families to stay in the car and not come in. But as you're building an office and looking into the future, you know, we touched on waiting areas to become smaller. Well, what's happening with that parent that is accompanying the child, for example. So perhaps family seating is happening in the operatory instead of the waiting room. So again, having a little bit more width there and allowing for a family member to come in and have a seat or two um, is something we want to, to see. And then, you know, patient belongings and providing hooks in the operatories. I've been to many offices before where the patient is expected to just deal with their belongings and however they like to and purses end up on countertops and jackets on floors or on the foot of the chair. Um, this is something we want to really think through in the future is what is happening with patient belongings because those contamin possibly contaminated um, items that are personal to the patient like purses, we don't want them on countertops moving forward. And then the next um, category here is how do we equip a space, a new space um, post COVID? So definitely one thing that comes to mind is touch-free fixtures. Um, this is something that you can do in your existing office or planning in your future office is um, faucets throughout the areas that are touch-free, that are motion censored. This can happen like you see in the image here at the hand washing station, but also in all your bathrooms, having fixtures that you don't touch. And it goes way beyond the fixtures, right? If there's other, 
products out there today that are touchless, you might want to consider those as well. So there's soap dispensers, faucets we've touched on, paper towel dispensers that are motion censored, and even more and more appliances come coming out that you open um, with your knee or your hip or your elbow so you don't have to touch everything with your hands. And then one of my favorites is when the beverage bar does come back is these coffee lid dispensers that are touchless and um, just motion um, coffee lid dispensers that you see right in the middle down here on the image. Um, so those are those little small appliances and accessories, but there you mentioned before are doors and how doors could be propped open, vestibule or you know between waiting room and the clinical side. Um, doors really continue to be really high high traffic in high traffic areas and continue to be touched. There's many ways we can go around the door handle. Um, the image on the left looks like it has a door handle here. This is actually an oral surgeon that we built out here in Chicago. It has a barn door, a glass barn door that you can just tip with your elbow, for example, and it will pull and shut close. So it pulls close. It has its own um, ability. ability to like to pull close. Other ways of closing and opening doors would be kind of a wave switch um, that you see in the top right here or a barn door can be opened and closed um, by foot and standard doors could be also opened and closed shut with um, your elbow. So there's lots out there on the market. Um, so ask your design staff, you know, to incorporate something like this in your new office or um, some of these things can be retrofit in your existing office as well. So we touched on doors. Um, light switches are the next highest um, high touch areas where contamination might happen. Um, there's motion sensors. I think we've seen them all. Um, a lot of municipalities actually require motion sensors in bathrooms and in offices. And um, there's also another product out there that's a wave switch. So you just wave in front of it a few inches in front of it and it turns off and on. We actually incorporate a wave switch like this in one of our offices here. It's an urgent care for kids and um, triggering this switch with a wave actually um, frosted the entire glass front and door so it made it solid and private for when a patient was in. Um, but this urgent care was very much about not touching um, surfaces and touching as little as possible. So they incorporated those type of wave light switches throughout their entire office. Beyond the light switches, we have um, trash receptacles and cabinetry throughout. You know, think about how do you open and close your cabinets. There's many different types of ways of doing that without incorporating hardware. Um, so here in the image, we have a trash receptacle. You just wave your foot underneath this cabinet and the door opens and then you just tip it with your knee and the door pulls shut again. And this can also happen with cabinets. Upper cabinets can be operated by elbows and lowered by knees and hips. Um, so there's ways around reducing the amount of um, cabinets you're touching. Then um, dividers we touched on a few times. They can happen throughout the space um, between check-in and check-out stations, um, in the waiting area. So those are other ways to equip a new space and really plan that um, from the get-go when you're planning out your new office. Beyond equipping. Well, um, I think we've covered a lot there. Tell us a little bit about how we uh, choose our finishes when we build our new practices. Sure. So when it comes to choosing finishes, um, finishes you know are everywhere, and you need to think about um, how you're cleaning the finishes, these finishes. So when it comes to choosing a finish, cleanability and the maintenance um, is of higher importance than ever, I think. Um, we've done quite a bit of research and have spoken to many of our manufacturers and material distributors about um, you know what can we clean our surfaces with post-COVID. And to summarize our findings, um, 
we found that a 2% bleach solution or a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution are enough to disinfect your surfaces, but there, there's absolutely a catch. Like you can't just spray the solution on and wipe it down. You should actually spray down um, your surfaces, your countertops, and let that solution sit for at least six to eight minutes and before you wipe it down. And that's something that the CDC actually recommends. Um, so when you're choosing the type of flooring, um, you know, in the past carpeting might have been a warm feel that you were looking for, especially in the waiting room and in offices. And um, it also helps with acoustics, the carpeted flooring. Um, so down the corridor is something that we've, we've done a lot in the past, but equally important now than ever is the cleanability of your floor. And, um, you know, in speaking with our flooring manufacturers, porcelain tiles seem to be the most durable when it comes to cleaning with um, hydrogen peroxide or bleach solutions. And then we've gotten lots of answers from luxury vinyl tiles, which is probably the most common floor in dental offices. Um, and a lot of answers we've been gotten, they're, they're a little bit all over the board and different. So we encourage you that, you know, before you put those solutions on your floors, um, you know, do check with your designer who specified your flooring or check with the manufacturer. Um, but going forward and designing floors throughout, I think I would always recommend a hard surface that you can clean and, um, you know, even, even with a soap solution, it does cut down on dirt and grime. So moving on from flooring to ceilings, um, probably the most popular ceiling in dental offices are acoustical ceiling tile and grid because they provide excellent acoustical performance and they, they also give you the access to the mechanicals above. But in some areas, like perhaps in surgical suites, you might want to consider a different type of ceiling. And what comes to mind there is either a vinyl acoustical tile, so it's the same type of product as an acoustical tile, but it is wrapped in a vinyl face, which you know once in a while you might want to wipe down, um, or a gypsum board or a drywall ceiling, um, as it gives you a hard surface that can be wiped down periodically. Um, from ceilings, we'll move down to walls. You know, walls can be painted. That's the most economical way. Um, there is scrubbable paint and wipeable paint, and I'm talking, you know, beyond the eggshell paint you can get at a home improvement store. Um, but there's architectural paints out there that are meant to be um, scrubbed and cleaned. Um, and the other things on surfaces to consider for walls are vinyl wall coverings. As the name says, you know, it's a vinyl product, so it can be wiped down. Um, we like to use those in high traffic areas and, you know, moving forward, you might want to consider vinyl wall covering in operatories where you can take a soap solution and wipe down um, your walls. Now, cleaning with soap and water, it removes germs and dirt and um, it you know, impurities come off these surfaces by cleaning and it lowers the risk of spreading infection. Now, the better way to doing things is disinfecting as it kills the germs in surface, of course. And by killing germs on the surface after cleaning, it can further lower the risk of spreading infection. Which brings us to countertops because I think that's where we use um, disinfectants the most. So countertops, there's different um, types of materials you can use on countertops. Quartz is um, probably the higher end material. It's a man-made stone and can be easily cleaned with hydrogen peroxide or bleach solution. Um, solid surface is a little bit more uh, softer of a resin material. And, and then there's of course laminate, which is the most cost effective material you can use when um, building or purchasing countertops and cabinets. With those solid surface and laminates, we've um, talked to our uh, manufacturers of these materials and we've gotten lots of um, different cleaning protocols and different um, feedback from them. So I would really encourage you, don't just spray down your countertops with a strong solution. 
do check with your designer or cabinet installer first of what brand was used and um, check with the manufacturer to see of what is recommended for cleaning and disinfecting of those um, countertops and cabinets. So we've touched a lot on um, what to look for when building a new practice. Um, I guess, Monica, from here, um, how do we give patients and staff reassurance going forward? Yeah, I think we've touched on many points um, today that, you know, when you're planning a new office or what can you do to your existing office post-COVID. And many of these implementations that we touched on today will actually provide the reassurance, um, you know, especially the visible ones you touched on, Dale. Um, so, you know, you want to promote those, um, those implementations to your patients and to your staff and you want to get your business back on track. And so I want to summarize a few of them that we touched on today. So those were hygiene supplies and hand sanitization, um, signage on hygiene etiquette, and then patient education on monitors and informing them of all the steps you're taking in your office every day. Um, and then those physical barriers that we touched on throughout the office and then adjustments to your waiting room, like the quantity of chairs and removal of toys and so on. And then having the patients see your ha washing your hands, so even if you're using hand sanitizer, um, you know, apply that while you're walking into the operatory and put on fresh gloves right in front of your patients. That is something that gives the patient um, reassurance and calms them down. And then, um, you know, plan for different protocol on minimal and touchless check-in and check-out processes. And then for your staff, um, you know, individual workstations, you know, share as little equipment as possible, uh, provide PPE for all your staff, not just clinical staff, and provide laundry facilities in the office and, um, or, or contract a, a laundry service. Uh, service. So, Bottom line is, you know, like people are going to feel uncomfortable in in the beginning, and it's not just the patients; it's it's the staff all, also, and we need to, um, you know, think think about that. We've talked to quite a few um, of our clients, didn't we, that said, like, you know, our it's not just our patients; it's it's our staff as well. Um, they they might be scared as well. So, um, you know, with that, I think we can also provide something else that you want to talk about is soft. Open. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, as uh, the states are opening back up, and I think Jean mentioned at the beginning, um, it was somewhat sudden here in um, Illinois. Uh, I think we got notification on Friday or Saturday and uh, practices started opening on Monday. Um, but there is another way that we haven't touched on yet to help with re-engaging your staff, which is to consider soft open of your practice. You know, we've heard from some doctors about how this reminds them of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s when they previously did not use gloves when treating patients, but subsequently had to implement glove usage. So, so you need a little time to teach yourself and your team how to treat your patients in the new era of COVID-19, just as Dennis did with previous epidemics. The other thing to consider is extending appointment times to give your staff enough time for changing PPE and as well as some um, cleaning between patients and prepare for the next patient. But above all, uh, communicate and over communicate. You know, uh, communication is key as they say. Reach out to the patients, reach out to the staff, you know, use direct mailing or social media. Let the patient know about the steps you've taken not only within as they enter the practice, as we mentioned earlier on, but try that good old fashioned um, paper letter in their mailbox, just letting them know what you're doing and what you've done to try to keep them safe when they come to your practice. Keep up the heightened communication with staff. What they say is, um, you know, when a staff member receives a handwritten note from uh, their employer or their um, team leader, that's of all importance to them. So. Just continue to communicate with your staff verbally and, and through written communication. Daily huddles and continuing, you know, lessons learned 
within your uh, practice is also very important. So with all that being said, um, that concludes our presentation on how we see COVID-19 impacting dental office design going forward. And with that, I'd um, like to uh, thank everyone for their attention and want to hand it back to you, Jean. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dale and, and um, Monica. I know there um, probably are, people are thinking about everything that they could be doing and, and should be doing. I think, you know, my takeaway is some barriers in between the rooms and, you know, obviously, I think there was one comment or question, and I think it had to do when you were on the, um, Dale, when you were explaining the uh, HVAC system and kind of just everything pertaining to the, um, fil you know, filtrations. Um, and just a question, you had said 300 installations worldwide, and the person said 300 installations worldwide, almost like that seems like not much. Was it 300 <laughs> really, or was it more than that? Uh, my apology, 300,000 installations worldwide. Um, yeah. And just, yeah, just to touch on the ionization process, that's something that you see a lot in large hospital systems, and we're seeing it um, and we're recommending it for dental practices now. Um, and, you know, again, going back to the filtration, the HEPA filtration, you know, that is being recommended, but I do want to point out again the difference in the size of the molecule. Um, HEPA filters, they catch uh, molecules that are 0.3 micron in size, and um, the coronavirus by itself is 0.125. And um, what they're saying is most of the time, uh, coronavirus is contained within um, droplets of water, which is larger, so these HEPA filters do catch it. But that's really why we've narrowed in on the ionization. So just not that we would hold you to this, but if someone were out there and they're they're saying in their head like, "Hey, there were some great ideas today, but I'm not gonna, I'm not building a practice. I have my existing practice." What if 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 you had your brother on the line who was a dentist, and this is a question to either of you, what what would you say like, "Hey, this is what I would do. This is like a good reassuring thing, and this is about how much it's gonna run you to do what you're gonna propose." I'm not saying you are proposing it. I'm not saying you're selling it. I'm just saying like, if, if you had to make a decision today and you were sitting in their seat right now and you weren't doing a build out, you weren't doing a new practice, you were actually had to go back to your practice, what would you recommend they do? Like what makes sense? Uh, Monica, do you want to start first from uh, physical barriers and yeah, I'll go I on think the HAC? And to your existing practice, um, you know, what is easy to do and brings a lot of um, separation and reassurance is, you know, those physical barriers throughout. So having, you know, like a sneeze guard at the reception desk, that's easy to implement. Um, you know, same with separation in the waiting area or if you have an, a bay of um, orthopedo chairs, bringing those physical barriers in. That's something that is um, simple. But it does help, you know, it does help from, you know, droplets flying through speech. Um, and, you know, it, it's something that's fairly cost effective and can, you know, can be removed, but it doesn't have to in the future. You know, so we you, did. If I can, sorry, I'm going to interject a little. So, Monica, are you referring to like, like when you say a sneeze barrier, more like something that would go on top of the reception desk as like a plexiglass barrier? Or are you referring, you mentioned earlier, like in an open bay, hanging it from the ceiling to separate the chairs in the open bays. Is that kind of what you're thinking when you're saying that? Exactly. Yep. So you can see those, um, all, you can find those on the internet, um, you know, you can, you can call somebody local that you have there, but those are exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. So any reception desk, I would assume would have some sort of a transaction top that could take one of those sneeze guards that you just have freestanding on top of your transaction top. And what that does, it really gives you a physical barrier between the staff member and the patient. So when you're speaking, um, the droplets are being caught per se, mm -hmm. if you were not wearing a mask perhaps in a, in a month or two, if that is being lifted. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the thing. Same, yeah, like you're saying in the, in the bay, 
um, or in treatment rooms. You know, we've been seeing a lot of open treatment rooms in, in the last decade. Um, doctors are looking for some sort of more separation or even aftermarket um, doors to go over those openings. And those can be all done out of glass or acrylic panels. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I also noticed that, you know, in regards to like the barn doors, like that's an outside hanging door. So on some of those operatories that, that could be, if they're an existing space, that could be maybe incorporated. Is that what you're kind of thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. you know, you might have a carpenter want to come in and add some blocking there to support the weight of a door like this. Um, to, it would be a little bit more than just um, hanging something with two screws. But, right. um, you know, given that you have blocking or you could add blocking to an existing door opening, a barn door would give you that separation. Um, you know, some of these things are more psychological and others are actual physical barriers. Um, but yeah, anything helps and time will show, you know, what is the best solution here. But um, there's been a lot of research, I think, on, on the um, filtration side of things. Yeah, yeah and go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I just wanted to touch on um, the physical um, barriers. Um, and we talked earlier about the travel path of the patient. Um, and in practices, it's really difficult to say, how can we maintain six feet between patients and staff and other patients? Um, so trying to walk through your practice and say, where am I going to potentially have contact between people? How can I try to avoid that? And where I might have contact, what can I put up temporarily? Um, I thought your um, uh, illustration was good. If it was my brother that was a dentist looking to do something temporary, what would I recommend? Um, it goes back to the unknowns that we discussed earlier on in the presentation. Um, I've seen some very temporary solutions out there, um, such as like medical curtains that can easily be laundried or washed, those getting hung up to try to separate spaces. Um, I've seen some really rudimentary type of uh, exhausting systems set up where um, it's high, uh, like a, a large um, harp type material or clear plastic that gets applied in door openings and then there's an exhausting system to the outdoors. Um, those kind of systems, uh, I think, maybe would impact um, patients' perception of the professionalism of the practice. I guess it depends on what sort of image you're trying to portray. My recommendation, like I said earlier, uh, from a ventilation standpoint, is just do it right now because I'm, I'm, I feel very confident that there are going to be long-term implications around ventilation. Um, so seeing that, um, you know, there's conversation around the UV lights, around the HEPA filtration, um, as we mentioned, this ionization system, which is um, we feel is really uh, the proper way of doing it. I would say definitely invest in HVAC right now um, in view of, you know, coming out ahead and, and, and reassuring everyone involved as well. And this is something you can do post-construction, right? That's right, yeah. So this is not something that's um, necessarily uh, only allowed for new construction or only available for new construction or when you put in a new HVAC system, this can be retrofitted into the system. So just, again, not holding you to this, but <clears throat> so if that were retrofitted into an existing system, what is the time frame that that would take for a practice to do that? And just, again, just a broad scope, like what would be the low end, what would be the high end of something like that for a practice in cost? Sure thing, yeah. Um, and cost and timing is a, a important conversation. As a matter of fact, it's... Um, it's very, uh, very much on our radar right now. There's a lot of doctors that um, have been trying to get things done quickly um, while they're closed, so they didn't have any downtime when they opened up. And obviously, they were they would utilize the um, what we've installed as potential marketing and, and reassurance for the uh, staff. So, from a cost standpoint, on a low end, we've seen as low as ten thousand um, dollars for. Uh, retrofitting systems and, and putting in sneeze guards and uh, temporarily um, barricading off some areas or blocking, you know, beverage station and drinking fountains. Um, but for larger practices, we've seen it go up to forty, fifty thousand dollars. 
um, in cost. And then from a timing perspective, um, it can be done as quickly as a week or it could take two or three weeks, you know, for ordering up materials. The installation of the systems doesn't take three weeks. It would take probably about a week, even in the most um, extreme situations. Um, but yeah, generally speaking with lead times, my guess is you're probably somewhere between one and three weeks from a timing so playing standpoint. Playing the devil's advocate here, um, if I were a dentist and I wanted to install an ionization system, should I install it only in the treatment room, so throughout the entire office? Yeah, that's good. There's been conversation around um, should we create more of a um, sterile environment in the back and then have our admin areas non-sterile. The challenge is, is that um, that works great in hospital settings. You might have an OR and you go through um, automatic doors and there's a definite pressure difference and um, it's very obvious that it's much more sterile environment. Um, uh, in a dental office, they're much smaller spaces and I would recommend that you put the system in to control the entire office, not just for uh, individual rooms. Now there are isolation rooms and I wanna be clear about that. If you're looking to create an isolation room uh, within your dental office, specific isolation rooms. Um, those can have their own standalone systems, but I do um, overall think that you should look at the entire office and the heating and cooling system for your entire office and how you might be able to protect patients and staff throughout the office. Okay, great. Well, you answered some great, great questions, gave me some better clarity, I'm sure other people feel the same way. Um, any additional questions from anyone that's out there? I'm not seeing anything in chat or anything in the QA. Please feel free. I'm going to pop up the polling. Um, if you can go ahead and answer the polling again. This is just a fun exercise. Um, maybe you'll be thinking of some questions while you're reading these questions or I'm reading the questions to you. Who are you? Are you a dentist, associate, hygienist, RDA, DA, office manager, administrator? Are you ready to reopen? Yes or no? Do you feel comfortable with it? Do you have enough PPE protection? Do you feel safe? Um, true or false? Do you feel prepared to reopen your practice? Do you feel you have proper barriers and protection, not just PPE related? So keep answering those. Um, somebody's saying thank you for another great lecture. Thanks, Jennifer, we appreciate it. Um, it's people like all of you that come every day or, or, or at least a couple of times a week when you're not Zoomed out that you um, are making this uh, much more uh, rewarding for us. I think for us, it's, it's about educating you and helping you to make good decisions in your business and the best care that we can deliver in a patient-focused practice. So thank you for joining us. We're not ready to leave yet. Would negative pressure be advised? Question. Would a negative pressure be advised? Yes. Um, so it goes back to uh, what I mentioned about uh, isolation rooms. Negative pressure is most uh, often seen in isolation rooms. So if you have a specific surgery room, if you're a general dentist and you're going to be doing any type of surgery, you might create an isolation room that uses negative pressure. But generally speaking, you can't create negative pressure throughout the entire office um, easily, and it, um, it, it does cause strain on the HVAC system. So um, negative pressure should be more isolated to individual rooms if it's desired. Okay, good. Um, keep feeling comfortable at answering more of the questions. The more you uh, answer, the better results we get. And we at least get a feel for the audience and, and what's happening out there. Right now we've got trending dentists online are 56% of the attendees, 11% are associates, 11% are hygienists, great, I'm glad you're here. 22% are office managers, great, glad you're here. Um, are you ready to open? 56% say they are ready to open, 44% say no they're not. I have enough PPE and protection. I feel safe. True or false? 56% of you said true. You do feel safe. You feel that you have enough PPE and protection. 50, I'm sorry, 50% of you said true. 50% of you said false. So that's a split. Uh, do you feel prepared to reopen to your practice? I have the proper barriers and protection, not PPE related. 36% of you said yes. 
64% of you said no. You do not feel like you have the proper barriers and protection, not PPE related. So that's interesting. Um, we now, the trend is going up for, um, do you have enough PPE and protection? I feel safe. 55% are saying no, they don't. 45 are saying, yeah, I, I do. So that switched, it was, it was about even. And, uh, and are you ready to open? That too switched. So 45% of you saying yes, 55% of you are saying no, you're not ready to open. Um, so interesting, very, very interesting. The number of dentists, 64% are on the line, 18% are associates, 9% are hygienists, 18% are office managers. So um, feel free, there's still a few minutes left. Um, I would love for you to keep answering. We, we've got about a third of you that have answered. Trust me, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. I just think it's a great exercise to get some of these stats. I'm um, going to put them on one big slide and, and at some point in this week, I'm hoping, and share it because I think it's great. I'll probably also put it out there in a marketing piece, not to market you, but just so that you get an idea of what I've got when I can you know, put all these information questions together. It's so interesting to me to see the trends and then to be able to different, you know, read different news articles or news stations and listen to what's out there in the general public, it kind of helps me to just kind of say, wow, that's interesting. That's kind of how the audience was answering or that isn't what I'm hearing from the dental specific world. So, so yeah, anything you can answer is great. Um, please keep going. We do have another question here and oh, we answered that one about the negative pressure. And then the other thing is from Andreas. Thanks for putting this great information. I wish I would have selected Apex for my build out. Well, that's great. Uh, next one. That was We're very so nice. And that's a non-paid solicitation. <laughs> All right, we're still going. So let me just end the polling. It looks like we're about done here. Um, so again, 64, I think you can, I'm gonna share the results with the screen with you. Um, can you guys all see this? Yep. 64% were dentists. 55% of you said you're not, you're not ready to reopen. 55% of you said you don't have enough PPE and you don't feel safe. And 64% of you said you do not have enough information to feel protected with barriers. So, hey, Apex, thanks so much, Monica and Dale. I really, really appreciate you taking your time out of your day, trying to socially distance as best as you can. You did a great job. I hope you all stay safe and, safe and healthy. And um, again, once again, thank you. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jean, and everyone watching us today and listening to us. Okay. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. See you tomorrow if you're Bye. coming in. Thanks. Bye-bye.